Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. But the reason we started all of this is because we have two pet bass named Bonnie and Clyde in our backyard pond. And they've grown over the years, so we wanted to move them to a bigger body of water. And we're getting excited because it's almost that time. We're just waiting on those tiger bass to get a little bit bigger. But not only that, the world's most aggressive bass, Moby, can hardly be contained in the 300 gallon aquarium. He is a beast and needs a bigger place to swim around. So we're going to be trapping some crawfish to put in the pond here in just a minute, but before we get into that, a quick update on the duck house. So if you missed the last video, we built a duck house that has solar panels, a retractable roof, a swimming pool and jacuzzi, and one of my personal favorites, a motion activated splash pad. It's even got front porch lights and an inverted aquarium that connects to the pond, so it allows those small fish to swim from the pond up into the duck house. It's got an onboard control system that automates the pumps and valves, and it has about a dozen different sensors tied into a microprocessor that gives us information like temperature, humidity, and other pond related parameters. And we didn't want the ducks to have to leave their new home, so we added a vegetable garden with automatic misters that should keep them happy. So we got everything set up right out here by the island, and now it's time to see who decided to come visit this week. And I couldn't believe the first bird to come by and check it out, Uncle Sam the bald eagle. It's been at least six months since we've seen the eagle, but he flew in and watched the duck house for about 15 to 20 minutes. And I honestly couldn't tell if he was looking for food in the house or just admiring it, but he was 100% intrigued by it, and it got me thinking, Maybe we should build a house similar to this and put it up in a treetop and potentially some eagles would come and nest in it. So leave us a comment down below if you think that's a good idea to duplicate the duck house and make another one for the eagles. And the next one to stop by is the possum we call George Jones. <laughs> and we put some cedar shavings inside the duck house and they have a really strong smell right now. <laughs> so I think that's what he's doing. I think he caught a whiff of that cedar. Can't really tell where it's coming from. That's pretty funny. And here's another interesting sequence of events. So one of the owls that we call Hooter flies up into the oak tree we put on the island. And at the same time, a blue heron flies in near the duck house. And the heron starts working his way towards the owl. And at this point, I think that the owl flies down to get a sip of water out of the pond. But the heron is interested to see what's going on and starts stalking his way over. But the owl said, that's close enough, I'm out of here. But the heron's been hanging out around the duck house a lot, and I'm not sure that that's a great idea, especially if there's baby ducks. I don't know if they'll get along or not, but you can also see there's some deer walking on the dam in the background, and the blue heron's still hunting. I know there's a lot of fish around that dock. I actually caught one of the biggest bass out of the pond a couple of weeks ago, right up underneath the duck house. And in our last video, we started a contest to see who could give us the best name for this new duck house. And the winner gets a chance to come spend a weekend with us out here on the farm. So we're going to leave that contest open for one more week. And the way to enter the contest is head over to Nate's channel called Nate Makes. And he's got a video of the full duck house build from start to finish. You leave a comment on his video. And he's going to select that winner next week and engrave that name onto the duck house. So you don't want to miss out on that opportunity. All right, it's time to set some crawfish traps. And basically you just put dog food, or in this case, we're gonna put bluegill food in these little compartments. And that keeps it from floating out of there. But once you get it all closed up, the crawfish is gonna crawl in through here and they're not smart enough to be able to get back out. Got the trap baited, time to head on down to the creek. All right, made it back here to the creek. We are on a dry spell, so I'm gonna have to find a spot that's deep enough, but there's definitely crawfish in here. You can see how swampy it all looks back here. We got it set out right there. Come back and check it in a couple of days. It's time to do some game day grilling and today we're gonna be cooking bacon wrapped butterfly back straps. 
And this video is brought to you by Kamikoto Knives. We've been using these knives since we started the pond build and I'm still extremely impressed with them. They're made out of high quality Japanese steel and they always have a very sharp edge. So I like to keep the marinade simple and just use dales and minced garlic and let it soak for 20 to 30 minutes. And then I like to cut the back strap in thirds. And today we're gonna butterfly these and that's basically cutting a thin strip down the center and then folding it over and that kind of gives it that fillet look. But one other thing I like to do is pre-cook the bacon. And an easy way to do that is just put it in the oven on 375 for about five minutes. And the reason for that is venison is a really lean meat and doesn't require as much cooking time as bacon. Now we're going to wrap them up in bacon, stick a toothpick through them, and then it's time for the grill. And the one key to cooking these is you don't want to overcook them. But the Kamikoto knives come in several different sets, but our favorite is probably the Kampeki. It seems to be perfect for our needs. It comes with a 7 inch vegetable knife, a 8.5 inch slicing knife, and a 5 inch utility knife. But don't just take it from me. These knives are used by Michelin star chefs all across the world. And they also come in this nice wooden box which makes it perfect for a gift. So if you're interested in checking them out, I'll put a link down in the video description that'll give you $50 off a knife set. Alright, back down here at the creek about a week later. Time to check the crawfish trap and see if we got anything. Almost looks like a little bluegill. Hmm. It's pretty interesting. We'll throw him back. All right, I might have had a malfunction with the trap. That's why we didn't catch any crawfish. But either way, I got some bait that lasted a little longer. We went back to the old childhood favorite, hot dogs, ham, and bacon. 100% guaranteed to catch crawfish. Let's see if we caught anything. Oh yeah. All right, first up, we got this little small creek chub or minnow. We'll throw him back. <laughs> well, that is a perfect size for our little bass that we call Tiger. I'm gonna bring him home to him. And look at here. This one's a little bigger. Might be for Moby. And then last but not least, this little guy. Another little bitty small one. All right, here's one more look at him. Moby snack, tiger snack, and another tiger snack. But what I decided I'm gonna do is feed these to the pets tonight, and then I'll come out here and catch some tomorrow and either fish with them or feed them to the pond bass. All right, he's got one big pincher, so we'll see what Moby thinks about him. So far, it looks like he's enjoying it. I think he's happy to finally get something other than a golden shiner. All right, time to see what Tiger thinks of his first crawfish. He's making the same face that Moby did. He's ready for another one. I'm not going to give him two in one day. You see his belly starting to poke out back there, but let's just see if he would eat another one. Here goes the finger. Oh, he's getting smart. Now it's time to check in on the aggressive bluegills. And I was talking to the biologist, and he told us to leave the protein feeders on as long as the bluegills are coming up and eating it. And he said typically throughout the year, as it gets colder and you move into the winter, they'll stop eating it. And we've had some cold weather recently, but so far they're still aggressive, so we're going to keep feeding them. And I'm probably going to go catch one of these here in a minute, so we can see how big they've gotten. Once the weather cooled off, the thread thin shad schooled up and we started seeing a lot of activity in the shallow areas. And we also put in several brush piles that have made homes for these tiny little bait fish. And you can see they're piled in here around these trees. And early in the morning and late in the evening, the bass will start chasing after them. So I'm going to put a camera underwater so we can see what's going on beneath the surface. There's one of the little guys coming in for a snack. I think he sees the GoPro. Got 
Got him. All right, instead of catching a bass today, I want to try to catch one of those bluegills and see how big they've gotten. So, got the little rooster tail. Here we go. Got one. Feels like a good one too. Man, this thing's fighting. Oh, it's a bass. <laughs> Wasn't even trying to catch one. Check out that little green on the top of his lip. That's pretty unique. All right, buddy, I'm gonna put you back and try to catch a bluegill. <laughs> he's a fat little guy i'd say that's probably what the average of them all look like they're growing good eating real good gaining weight all right head on back now it's time for a night lapse and it got pretty cool this evening and it actually turned the sky purple right before dark, which was pretty neat. And if you look closely, you'll see the little duck house lights over there as well. And it's cool to see how that cold weather makes that fog and those green lights glow. And even though I don't like them showing up, the little pesky blue heron is hanging out on the oak throne tonight. And I'll have to admit, his silhouette does make a pretty cool shot. And we've got a ton of wildlife out here on the farm, so it's time to start planting our fall and winter crops. And this year I'm trying out a new seed mix called Backwood Big River Blend. We're going to do that in some areas, and then this Dixie Six in other areas, and see which one they like more. And then we'll also be planting a lot of winter ryegrass up around the cabin. See, we got all the friendly white birds. We're down here in the half acre little food plot. Just got done putting out all the fertilizer. You can see it on the ground. And next up comes the winter peas. So deer love these peas in the winter time. They grow great here in this soil. And I pretty much keep this plot either planted with soybeans or peas. But we're gonna go ahead and put out some more G and D rack attack. And this is absolutely one of the things that I can tell that all the bucks liked. They ate it in about a day. But this is also where we just created one of our trails. So I know a lot of the deer are gonna start coming from the creek down there in the bottom, right out through this area, hitting the rack attack, and in the field as soon as we get it planted. And it's no surprise the bucks started piling in. We've even got some that are starting to lose their velvet. And this is a unique looking deer. He's got a split brow tine, which is pretty uncommon because most of the deer around here have that nice typical look. There's another angle of it. He's definitely unique. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm thinking this may be a bobcat. So here's something interesting. We've got George Jones out here eating when a coyote comes up. And man, the video cut off a little too soon. I'd have liked to have seen what happened there. We're seeing a lot more coyote activity this year. There's a pack of them running around. You can see them marking their territory. So about 10 years ago, we planted this oak tree in our backyard, and Liz's dad actually grew this tree from an acorn that he got off the University of Alabama's campus from some oak trees out there on the quad. And we're going to be planting a lot of oak trees out at the farm, so we decided this was a perfect time to bring Sarah up there and let her pick out some acorns. And who knows, maybe in 10 or 15 years, she'll be looking back on some trees like the one in our backyard. But there's no shortage of acorns out here. There's oak trees everywhere. You can see even the squirrels are enjoying them. So we got a big variety, and I'm going to show you a little tip to getting these to germinate here in a minute. Sarah got to go to her first Alabama football game. Liz and I both graduated from Alabama, and it's always good to go back to Tuscaloosa and catch a game. <laughs> yeah! 
All right, we got all the acorns here, about to do a water test, but the first thing you wanna do is pull that little top part off and they should all be dried out enough to where that just easily removes. Now it's time to do the sink test and the way this is supposed to work is the ones that sink down to the bottom are good and the ones that float are bad. And so far we've got all floaters. <laughs> now, seeing how that 99% of them floated, I'm not 100% sure that that's right or maybe the ones that float just aren't ready yet. Now the next step is to get some vermiculite and put all of the acorns down in it and add a little moisture to it and then put it in the refrigerator. And that cold temperature in the refrigerator kind of tricks the acorns into thinking it's time for them to sprout and so it can quicken up the process. But the key is you want to put a little bit of moisture in here but not too much. All right, I got the acorns in here, cypress in here, and we'll check back in on them in about three to four weeks. And so we got some other good news. There was a pregnant doe walking around the past month that looked like she was the size of a cow, and now we know why she had triplets. And so it's very common for white-tailed deer to have twins, but this is the first time I've ever seen triplets. But the three little ones seem to be happy and full of energy. Fingers crossed that the coyotes leave them alone. But here's something I didn't catch on until I was just re-watching this footage. Take a look above the bald cypress tree there, just above it and to the right. There's something climbing in the trees. It's just a dark silhouette, but you can see its eyes. And I think there's two or three of them. My first guess would probably be raccoons. But man, those would have to be some pretty big raccoons. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think it is. So we lost all the leaves on our cypress and oak trees with that last cold front. But it's time to cover them back up because the deer are starting to rub their antlers on them. And now it's time to feed Mr. Moby. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with the pond build series and all of the wildlife out here at the farm. Hope y'all enjoyed this one, and we will see you all next time.